Hello and welcome to today's Tech Talk and today I'm going to speak about threads and specifically how to use threads in the most efficient way. What can you do as a developer to get the best out of the system that you're running on? And we're going to start with asking one simple question. How many threads do you think is a good number? What I mean, let's imagine you have, you wrote a program and your program is going to run on a system and that system has a CPU. And let's say it is only one CPU. So how many threads would you create if you could choose so that you get the best out of that one CPU? And I would start with the claim that the best thing is actually not to spawn any threads. What I mean, if you don't have to do anything, if you can leave that CPU idle, that's the best you can do. Because think about all the consumer devices like laptops, mobile phones that run on the battery. And if you don't run anything extra on them, they just drain batteries uh, slower. But of course, at some point, you need to run something because we programmers, we are there to write programs and do some executions or do some work. So if you have to use that CPU, how many threads would you create? Let's try to see what happens when we create threads. So let's say we start with one thread. Well, that is a very good number because uh, one CPU can do efficiently only one thing. So it can run one thread. And if it's the only one thread in the system, then the CPU can run it all the time until the thread is done with its job. So if the thread has to do more, the CPU can still keep running that thread. And only after the thread is done, then the CPU stop running that thread. And the CPU actually, what the CPU is doing at that moment? Well, the CPU will have to execute special instruction, HLT, halt, well, which basically means don't do anything, just stay with the low power consumption and, well, just relax. So if we have one thread and we say it's good, what would if we add one more thread, what will happen? So let's imagine that. Now we have one CPU and two threads. Well, because we have only one CPU and, and we can execute only one thread at a time. Well, the operating system will schedule the CPU execution that way that it will run a bit of one thread and then a bit of another thread. So we'll do concurrent execution and what is most important is that we will be doing a lot of context switches. So we'll switch from one, from one thread to another thread. And that context switch is actually when we save the situation uh, that we were in, the, in this first thread and we switch to the execution of the second thread and that context switch is costly and it's actually it's a pure overhead so there is no performance improvement by just doing these context switches it's the losing performance and that's why having two threads on one cpu is already not a good idea performance wise it's still good for the interactivity but if you need that well, what if we have now, what if we have second CPU? Well, in that case, having two threads is actually good again. Because we have one thread running all the time it needs to finish the job. And we have second thread that is run by the second CPU, again, for as much time as it needs. There is no context switches, every CPU is busy 
we're doing its own thread. So as you can notice already, the good number of threads, it depends on the number of available CPUs. What happens if we add more thread? Again, the third one. In that case, again, one of the CPUs will have to start doing the context switches and pay the performance price for those context switches. So again, not a good idea. We don't like this, we like this. So we can say already that the number of threads, the ideal number of threads, equals the number of CPUs available. But it's only true if the threads, actually, if those threads have something to do. So if they have to, have to calculate something and they, cap, and they can keep the CPUs busy. So let's get back to the situation when we were with two threads. Well, it often happens that one of the threads, it has to do something uh, that stops it, that blocks it. Like, for example, reading the file from the disk to the memory. When we, at this point in the execution of the first thread, we want to read file from the memory and they use the blocking call, then from this moment till the moment, some moment in the future, when this file is available in the memory, the thread cannot run anymore. And the thread, what, ha what actually happens is that thread is put uh, in a waiting queue. So somewhere in the operating system area, there will be a waiting queue. And our thread will be added to that queue. So let's say it's our thread. Well, at this moment, when the thread is blocked and not doing anything, we have the CPU that is available for, for doing something else. So at this moment, if we come up with the third thread, we can fill this gap. We can utilize the CPU in a more efficient way. And that's why we need sometimes more threads than CPUs. And it really depends on how many uh, threads are blocked, how often they block, and for how long. What is important is that uh, if we answer that question, how many threads is ideal number of threads, we will say actually something like that. We will say it should be as many as we have CPUs and just enough threads to run in between uh, when, threads, when other threads are blocked and they cannot run. And by the way, if at this moment when the first thread is blocked and we want to run something else, if we would have to create that thread just in time, then we'll spend some time on just organizing, uh, creating the necessary memory structures to keep the data of that thread, and we'll waste some time. And if we have to do that every time, it's uh, again, it's a performance penalty. So the good idea is to have some threads idle somewhere on the side that don't run, but they can be brought into action when some of the other threads is blocked, when the CPU becomes idle. So that is the idea of the thread pool. The pre-created uh, threads, or just the threads that were created and not used anymore, and but not destroyed, and just sit there. Well, so how many threads would you create as a developer in your program? Actually, I would say I don't want to think about that. So with all that complexity, when I'm writing the program, I have no idea how many CPUs will I have available, will that program have available when it will run. Even if I knew that, 
what does it really change? Because let's say we have eight CPUs here, but I don't know how many other processes are active on that system at this moment. Maybe there is antivirus that is, that is running and scanning the files. Maybe there is a compiler that runs at the same time. Maybe there is a music player that plays the music. So maybe we, even though we have those eight CPUs on the machine, maybe there are only two, two CPUs that we can utilize for our program. And well, even then, we have no idea how often or for how long will those other threads block and how many threads we will need to have in the pool to fulfill uh, to fill those gaps in a, in a threads execution to keep the CPUs busy. So all that is actually very dependent on the situation that you're running in. So I would say I don't want to think about that as a programmer. I want my runtime environment to decide for me to see what's going on on that machine and decide how many threads should be active and how many threads should be in the pool. Well, that's nice, but what can I do as a developer to let runtime environment to decide? Let's think about the job that has to be done. When you write a program, you're probably thinking about some calculations or some, well, some amount of uh, things you need to do. Uh, so let's say you have the complete job that needs to be executed. So what can you do to get the power of multiple CPUs and let the work to be done in parallel? You can start thinking about, well, splitting the jobs in pieces and one of the ways, of course, is to think about threads and you actually split the whole job in multiple threads. And then you say, I will need one thread to execute this part. I will need another thread to execute this part and so on and so on. You can do that. But if you do that, then really you don't leave the runtime environment much choice. You just say, I want to create four threads which will be which have to execute four different things well runtime environment will have no choice than just to create those four threads even though it might be very inefficient at that moment to have four threads like if you're running on the one cpu so can be done better yes we can we just start, we just need to start thinking not in terms of threads, but in terms of, well, pieces of work that has to be done. So if I split the job in actually smaller blocks that are independent and it can be done, well, ideally in any sequence. If you think, well, I actually have to use that word. If you think in terms of tasks rather than threads, then we have something different because all those tasks you can actually put them in a queue and you can let the uh, uh, your runtime environment to think how many threads it will create to execute those tasks from the queue so let's say we have two CPUs and our runtime environment can decide to create two threads because two threads can run efficiently in parallel on two CPUs. In that case, while your first thread will go and pick first task from the task queue and the second thread will pick the second task from the task queue and we'll start execute them in parallel and if the first thread is done it can go and pick the next task from the task queue in this case we actually let the runtime environment to control the number of threads 
and we just uh, supply the job in that form that it's easy to parallelize. But if you have only one CPU, or for some reason this CPU becomes unavailable because someone else still wants to utilize it, we will have only one thread executing all of the tasks while it's still efficient because that one thread it will not do the context switches, it will continue picking up picking up tasks from the queue and there will be no price to do the context switch. The only one thing that we can still consider in this design is that, well, imagine we do have the second CPU and we have two threads picking up tasks from the, uh, from the task queue. Well, actually, we have to make sure that, the, that they don't pick the same task. So somewhere here will be probably some kind of synchronization mechanism. And when threads try to pick up tasks from the task queue, they will have to go through that synchronization mechanism to make sure that they access the queue uh, in a sequential order. So basically, we have the piece of inefficient piece of our design. Well, to solve it, what actually happens is that instead of having one queue for uh, all of the threads, we can have multiple queues and the queues per thread. So the first thread will be picking those tasks and the second thread will be picking tasks from its own queue. In this case, because while well, every thread picks task from its own queue, there is no synchronization uh, required. They just only once accessing that queue. Only in case when one of the threads has exhausted the tasks available in its queue, then it can go through this synchronization mechanism to the second queue, to, the, to steal some work from the other thread to help him uh, to finish the job faster. So we just saw that as a programmer you can do the better performance if you just start thinking about tasks and not threads and avoid creating threads yourself and let your runtime environment do it for you. And uh, well, in .NET, we have this task parallel library that allows you to do exactly that. In other languages, you have different mechanisms available, but it all comes down to the fact that you are not creating threads yourself. In Java, for example, you can run the, uh, this kind of task on the thread, uh, on the executor that has a pool behind the scenes and achieve the similar effect. Allow your uh, virtual machine to decide for you how many threads needs to be created. So thank you for watching this and I hope you liked it. And of course, again, uh, if you liked it, as usually I will ask you to just click the like button and subscribe to my channel. And hopefully see you next time. And that's it for today. Bye.